So, uh, you know, I heard in the last talk, the speaker was, was talking about, you know, sales is really hard work, and I totally agree with that. I've been doing sales for a long time. Uh, but the purpose of my talk is to maybe uh, demystify sales a little bit for you guys if you're really just kind of going out and starting a brand new company. Uh, sales is obviously very critical to these early stage companies, whether you're selling investors or you're selling new hires and employees or you're selling customers. So I think uh, hopefully these, uh, these techniques will be uh, relevant for you. Um, and just like what are my credentials to even talk about this topic? Uh, so, you know, I founded uh, two venture-backed companies in the last five years, uh, uh, both of which uh, have raised about $55 million in venture capital uh, from firms like Kleiner Perkins. Uh, I ran enterprise sales at WebEx, and we, while I was there, we grew from about 300 people to about 2,000 people globally. Um, and I, my team managed all of the Fortune 1000 accounts there. Uh, and then I closely advised companies like Palantir on their go-to-market strategy. And, and work with a bunch of other kind of you know, high profile companies here in the Bay Area. Uh, but I, what, I, what I'd more importantly say is actually I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, so you can see here uh, over the last, let's call it, I don't know, 13 or 14 years now, I've so worked about 10,000 sales opportunities. I actually added it up at one point. Uh, and I lost 7,500 deals. But I also won about 2,500. So uh, you know, hopefully some of these kind of tips or approaches might be useful for what you're thinking about. Um, so what are we going to cover today? Uh, you know, what's your message? Who do you take it to? How do you communicate that all? Uh, how do you deal with pricing? I think that's really critical in kind of the early stages of trying to find product market fit and, and making sure that that's uh, going to work for you. And then validating and iterating and validating and iterating and, and uh, making that kind of a really core uh, approach that you leverage as you build your company. All right, so you know, what's your message? You know, this is kind of the starting point, uh, and it really needs to start with a pain or some kind of you know, breakthrough observation. Uh, and you know, we also need to deliver against that pain a solution that solves that problem for the customer or the user and delivers real value. Uh, so you know, that seems pretty obvious when you see it written up here. But if you ask a lot of these entrepreneurs, hey, what's your, what's your company about? They start going into jargon or they're sp you know, speaking at you know, 150 miles an hour and you don't even really understand what they're talking about. So you know, a couple ideas I have for that are, you know, first of all, just a test. Is this in English? Do we even understand what these people are talking about? And uh, you know, my, I like to think of it as the grandma test. I've actually recently heard about it as the two beer test. So if you're at a bar and you have two beers, then you explain what you actually do. Uh, you know, th if it makes sense, then you're probably onto something. If you're still scratching your head, you know, maybe not. Uh, and you know, I like to kind of you know put myself in the buyer's shoes and think you know, like, you know, would I buy this? Like, if, can I empathize with the problem statement? And it, you know, if I understand their kind of circumstance. Uh, and their situation, you know, does it, does it connect with me, right? Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, when we're in an early stage company and we're, we're speculating around, like, what's the potential, you know, business impact, you know, do you have case studies? Probably not. Do you have, like, six or 12 months of usage of people really using this thing? Probably not. You know, I think it's okay. You know, I said here that, you know, the benefits can be made up numbers, you know, but the point here is we should try to quantify the potential impact or even what we aspire to when we talk about a real benefit statement, right? So by using this, you know, we believe we can solve this pain with this solution, and we think it's going to deliver this amount of value, right? A dollars or numbers or percentages, something that's actually going to kind of help quantify that impact. And then, uh, you know, obviously as we kind of learn more, as we deploy more, and as we actually kind of get our product into the hands of real users, we're actually going to study the real impact that we're delivering. Uh, does this make sense so far? Any challenges or questions or comments, observations? No. Nope. Two beers, all right. So, okay, so once you have a message, and hopefully everybody here is working on that message, making it really simple, grandma test, you know, hopefully quantifying it, dollars, numbers, percentages. You know, now we have to talk about, you know, who are we gonna take that to? And you know, what I, what I hear from entrepreneurs all the time is like, everybody's our target market. Everyone, this thing is so big, that everybody could use this, right? And you know, I, I kind of think about it a different way, which is, if you could only have 50 conversations, 
you know, what characteristics would those 50 targets share? Is it that they're high tech, that they're maybe desirable, desirable from a proximity standpoint, they're in the Bay Area? Um, you know, is it that they're growing? Is it that they're, you know, high margin businesses uh, that really are investing in knowledge workers? Is it the, you know, wh what's the characteristic there? Um, and then, you know, what's the title of the target inside those companies, right? Companies don't buy software, you know, people buy software. And so you have to find who's going to be, you know, the, the champion for this. Uh, and, you know, then the question is, like, if we know what kind of, you know, criteria we have for the target market, and we're very specific, right? We've got lots of kind of hypo hypothesis-based criteria there. And we, we, know, we know who the target buyers are, or we have some guesses there. Then we have to think about how we're going to reach those people, right? And so, you know, and you know, I think today in the world of the internet and you know all the kind of access to data that we have, I mean, it's almost like it's almost unfair. I got to tell you, when I was doing this like 15 years ago, you know, you were looking in like white pages, or you know, you'd have to buy like a, a subscription to like a data service to even find out who worked in companies. But you know, the reality is, by the way, like today. You know, I have uh, my, my new company, BetterWorks. Uh, we have about 30 people. We're working with, uh, you know, about 25 enterprise customers. I probably spend about an hour in LinkedIn every day. Mostly not on the sales side now, but more on like kind of like uh, you know, looking for engineers and, and people that we want to hire. Uh, but, you know, LinkedIn is like a, a massive asset that nobody ever, you know, had 10 years ago. Uh, but there's also other, I think, uh, things that you can test here. And so like Jigsaw is a service from Salesforce that um, uh, is called data.com. And you can actually uh, look for contacts and do really nice screen kind of filters. Uh, you know, if you want to research a target market, maybe, maybe they're blue collar, maybe they're not in LinkedIn, for example. Uh, you know, you could go and run a test on Odesk or Freelancer to kind of research some of your target market. Um, you know, Google AdWords, you can run a test, put some AdWords up. You know, I, I've heard the entrepreneurs say, oh, this thing's going to be great. All I need is like some marketing dollars, and then I'm going to really scale this business. And, you know, then it's like, okay, well, why don't you put $50 into AdWords, and then let's see if you kind of can crack the code on like what it takes to actually get people to your website, filling out the form, converting to a trial, and then going from a trial to a paid thing. You know, uh, you know it's easy to start doing things today uh, like that, running tests. Um, and you know, but I think the key thing here is like it takes effort and creative thinking and, you know, really what you're trying to do is just identify who to go after. And once you've done that, now it's really about what do we even say to them, how are we going to engage them, and how are we going to get them excited about what we're talking about. And I'm going to talk about that next. Any questions on this so far? Okay. So, and actually I was just going to share like Badgeville's experience. So Badgeville is now a company that's like four or five years old, works with hundreds of the Fortune 1000. It does uh, customer engagement, customer loyalty types of applications. And I started the company in 2010. Um, uh, nobody wanted to fund the company at the time. It was just a concept. People weren't sure, you know, what's this gamification thing? Uh, but, you know, I ended up taking uh, the message to about 100 companies. Uh, 90 said they weren't interested. But guess what? 10 actually signed up as our, our first paying customers. And we did about $500,000 in, in uh, bookings uh, in that first, like, four or five months. Um, and by doing that, we actually learned a lot about the messaging, what worked, what, did, what didn't work, and we, you know, we iterated pretty heavily. And I, I'm actually going to show you some examples of that as we go through this. Um, okay, so uh, now we say, let's say we have our, we got our target market, right, our 50 kinds of companies. We've identified the titles of the people that we really want to go after. Maybe it might be one title. Maybe it's just like the chief compliance officer or the VP of compliance. Or, you know, maybe it's like, hey, we, we sell to HR and the COO. So maybe we identify two or three contacts at each of these companies. Now it's time to reach out to those people. And you can do that over LinkedIn. You can do it over email. Uh, what I find is that people don't really use the phone any much a, a anymore. You know, 15 years ago, you spent, you know, 10 years ago, all you did was spend t time on the phone. Now, actually, I think people expect to be reached out to over email, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Uh, just a funny story. Uh, you know, I, I know there was one, uh, one company that we sold to where if you sent the executive an email, they never replied. But if you sent them a LinkedIn message, they would get back to you instantly. So you almost have to be sensitive to kind of how people want to be reached out to. I don't know what that person's doing on LinkedIn all the time, but I don't know. But uh, so, you know, subject matters, body matters. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. I think, yeah. So, 
so, okay, but you know, the point here is that uh, our goal when we're reaching out to somebody, especially if we have an early stage kind of product, remember this talk is about how to get your first 10 customers. Maybe you have zero customers, maybe you have one customer. You know, you're working on your first five or 10. You know, your goal here really is to just set up a meeting so that you can have a briefing with them, right? And you want to kind of share with them your ideas and kind of your observations on what you think are some pains and some possible solutions. And you basically want to bounce that, uh, those concepts off them. Um, so, and I like to think of it as you found this alien technology in your backyard and you want to call them up knowing that they're the industry expert and kind of like get their feedback on all this stuff. You know, like we found this stuff over here. You know, what do you think we should do with this, right? Does that make sense? All right, so, uh, so I'll give you some examples of, you know, just some emails that I sent. And these are like real, real emails using this exact same process. Uh, so, uh, so we'll start actually right here. So by the way, the subject matters. So I always do something like Roy, this guy's name was Roy, comma, about engagement, right? It's not like, uh, you know, uh, I want to, you know, present my product to you or something like that, right? It's just about engagement. What, how do we get this guy to open the email? And then look at my email here. This is my email. Have you ever seen those emails that entrepreneurs send and they're like paragraph after paragraph after paragraph and there's like four PDF attachments, right? And they just like said, I think you said it, like they're sending everything, right? So here's what my idea was. I said, hey Roy, I have a few ideas on how to do the drive engagement for blank. Here's some ways that we can kind of do it. This is similar to maybe somebody that you know that is doing. And I was wondering if we could do a 20 minute phone call. And then in my case, like, you know, I actually just put like some stuff about the company below my signature, just in case they're interested in just a little bit more context, right? And so what did the guy say here? Chris, I'm not your best contact. In the next few weeks, we're gonna be hiring someone to do this and, you know, talk to them then. So I guess what I do, thanks Roy, I appreciate that. Two weeks later, hey Roy, did you bring on that person? Can you introduce me? And they, then they'll forward it to the person and say, you know, hey Bob, uh, could you please talk to Chris? And now, we have, we're, now we're doing a conversation, all right? And you know, here's another example. Uh, oh, in this case, by the way, if you think there might be two contacts, I wouldn't send like two emails to two separate people because then that kind of like, they feel like you're maybe spamming them or getting angry, you know, or they're gonna get angry. So why not just send it to both of them? Jake and Jen about engagement. And then I sent it and Jake said, hey, sure, Chris, I'm the contact for stuff like this. You know, can I learn a little bit more? And you might reply here, I have, happy to talk to you in more detail about this. You might not even have a one pager just yet. Hey, happy to hop on the phone and talk with, it, talk with you for 15 or 20 minutes. Are these exam examples useful, by the way? Okay. All right, I try to just keep it as practical as possible. Yeah, that's fine. We're, we're, raise your hand. We're, if you have a question. All right. Okay, that's fine, sorry. Uh, hi, actually, um, my question is actually what works and what doesn't work uh -huh. uh, is very subjective in sales. Like uh, what happens is like uh, you send a certain kind of email or make a certain kind of cold call and yeah. it works for you one time like, okay, well, only one of them in 100 is gonna be successful. And uh, there is this like super, like you get so excited, okay, I'm gonna try the same thing again. And uh, it doesn't really happen again, I okay. mean. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I, so I do think it is data driven. I think that you can look at uh, like things like open rates. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we are, at, at my company, we're always studying kind of what works, what doesn't work. And it doesn't have to be actually just even for sales. You wanna do, like if your product has email notifications, you're still studying the open rates and the effectiveness and the click-through rates on, on like even post sales and how customers use it. So you're just applying those concepts, I think, to this as well. And you know, I don't think you're looking for the 1% response. I think you're looking for the like, hey, 30, 40% of the time people open this and maybe 10 or 15% you know, of, the, of the total population take an action, which is like they, they express some kind of interest. If you told me, hey, I'm only getting 1% t taking action on this, I would say the messaging isn't right yet. You're not using their, their words. You're maybe using your own words and by spending more time with customers, you might learn what words are you know, kind of connecting with them. Yeah. Was there a question here? Okay. Uh, 
can i just follow up j- uh, bit on that okay yeah uh, so actually like we we used to have a big debate in our sales organization uh, like uh, s- uh, for example on the customization of email sometimes like you have a big database and you just send send across generalized one uh, and it is appreciated and not appreciated as well and if you make it very customized to a person then uh, there were at times like there were some success but at times there were questions like oh god like you're getting uh, you got too personal with me like uh, where did you get my information from uh you see what i m- mean to say like if you customize your email to a uh, to a director in certain department and he d- I, i don't think i i don't know if i buy that i think mm-hmm. y- your question is can you customize it too much that yeah, they're yeah. like creeped out from the email <laughs> and yeah. you know like i don't think i i don't think i've actually heard of like your email is too personalized <laughs> i don't think i've ever heard that i've heard like a uh, wow you seem to know a lot about our business or wow you know uh you know thank you so much for reading my article uh, i'm glad you liked it so much so i i'm having a hard time with that one but let's carry on okay so uh any again just more examples i mean we can just keep showing more examples but this one was uh, oh this one is like so you know i think paul talked about you know it's hard work you know it persistence does matter here right and think about like how many emails you get and sometimes like i don't know maybe you're busy one morning or you're thinking about dropping the kids off or you've got like girlfriend problems or, you know like just life comes in you know g- is a problem for people sometimes so you know you have to follow up and ch- and chase them and you can see here you know hey greg and tess blah 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 and then you know i kind of like this whole approach of like hey just tess you got to let me know either way right cuz if you know i i know for me in sales is great no means you're not interested and I, if i believe that you actually believe no is the right answer like hey chris you know i looked at your product we don't need it because of blank blank and blank and that seems like a very reasonable rational argument that's the best answer i could ever hope for but like no answer and not knowing like i just have to kind of keep keep attacking until i hear a real no and i believe your no so there's nothing wrong and by the way at our company today we actually have a a, a policy where we actually send this four times and we rep- we we show by the way the showing the prior attempts actually increases the success rate um so you know and again you'll just kind of play with your own systems and figure that out all right but anyway that all that all we've talked about so far is just to get the meeting right that's the entire thing we just want to get access to the industry expert to share with them our hypothesis and our idea on what we think is going to be a compelling solution to solve a problem and hopefully we can articulate some benefits that are quantified in some respect that are you know based on like numbers dollars and percentages. Okay, everybody with me so far? All right. So, okay, now we have a meeting. And you know, one thing I find is like first of all, like people have like meetings that go way too long and people start to lose attention and so you got to keep these things very brief, right? I think like 20 25 minutes is perfectly fine to uh, you know achieve your objective. Right? And you know, and so it, part of this is like just learning how to run a meeting and keeping people kind of keeping the thing moving. So a couple ideas are like, you know, 2 to 3 minutes of introductions. You know, uh I think sometimes people, I hear this with entrepreneurs a lot, is they just jump right into the product. Let me show you the demo. Right? And you know, they don't even learn anything about like how the customer thinks about this or what's their viewpoint or what's their perspective or you know, have they even been thinking about this problem or you know, is this a big problem in their mind or a small problem? Right? So why not just say at the beginning here, uh, you know, I've introduced myself. I'm a you know i'm graduating from school and i've been really focused on this domain and we're we're really getting excited about all the research that we found in this area and you know i reached out to you because of blank blank and blank you're an industry expert you wrote the paper i read the paper it was very compelling to me and you know i'd love to kind of just show you a few ideas that i have on how i think we can solve a really valuable problem but before we get to that do you think i could ask you maybe like 5 minutes of questions do you think people would get upset if you did that no all right so sure well what do you have so how do you do this today have you been thinking about this we talked about that and then you know i think it's okay to you know show them your concepts now i am not a big believer in like spending a bunch of time in a demo so probably i don't know, do you guys have demos that were like software that you've already built yeah or no yeah yeah okay so you know i think like you could probably i bet you could probably take one or two screenshots of your software and that would tell the whole story of what the potential of what you're talking about is and maybe you might want to like set that up with like one or two slides it doesn't have to be like 
you know, my board of advisors and like, you know, you know, where I went to school and, you know, all these like kind of like, let's call them frilly slides. It's like maybe one slide is here's our understanding of the problem and here's our ideas for a solution and maybe some associated benefits. And then, you know, why not just show like one or two screenshots of your vision for what the software should look like and say, what do you think about this? Is this like exciting, compelling? You know, does it, is it like, does it, you know, connect with what you're thinking about? If we had this, like how valuable would that be for you? Um, so I don't know, that's, that's kind of the approach. And, you know, and then the nice thing about keeping this short is then you can spend, you know, more time on like, I see like so many entrepreneurs, they get to the end of the meeting and they're like doing the demo. Oh, one more thing I want to show you. Oh, one more thing. There's one other tab. Let me show you the other tab. And then they're like, oh, but like, let me show you this other like thing. And we have mobile too, right? And they're showing like everything and they like, oh, and then the person's like, oh, it's the top of the hour, gotta run. Oh, wait, oh, wait, wait, what about next, we'll follow, we'll be in touch. That's how they end. What about instead, you know, what's your reaction to what I've shown you so far? Obviously I can go, we can do a whole demo. We can set up a whole hour, two hours deep dive, technical review, security review, all that stuff. But based on what you've seen, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate how compelling this is, right? The other thing I hear from entrepreneurs is like, they ask like questions that are like they're le leading the witness, but in the wrong way. When you're starting a company, you're supposed to like, you're looking for product market fit and you're looking for real, va true, honest, open feedback. And so they'll ask their friends and then they'll go and have like maybe a customer meeting and the customer will be like, how much do you like this product, right? And you know, like I, you know, like if you ask your mom, she's probably not going to give you the greatest advice. You're like, oh, this looks great, sweetie, right? But she doesn't really know. And so, you know, it may be a better way to frame that is like, hey, on a scale of one to ten, how likely would you be to take action if what you saw today in slides was available today in software? Do you think that gives you a higher quality signal? Or, you know, on a scale of one to ten. Uh, how well do you think I've captured the pain that, that, uh, that you face on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis? They might say, actually, you know, if you frame it that way, you kind of talked about this, but actually I'm having this other big problem over here. Well, it's like, well, tell me more about that. Maybe we could also help you solve that problem, right? So anyway, so I think that's kind of like framing the questions in the right way. All right. Any questions on this? All right. Okay. Um, all right. So, how to deal with pricing? I, th I see a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs spend a lot of time creating these like models of like spreadsheets and Excel documents and volume pricing and all these different things. And you know, I think for your maybe for your like tenth ten customers to a hundred, maybe there's something there. But like zero to ten, we're you know we're just trying to figure it out. So. If they say, how much, what's your pricing? Your answer is, we haven't figured it out yet. Right? We haven't figured it out yet. And, you know, why is that? Well, you don't want to get disqualified by going in too high, and you don't want to undervalue your service at a fee that's too low, and you're still learning. You don't know really what the true implications of solving this problem are with this solution and the effort required to actually deploy the solution and the actual intended uh, kind of specific benefits that it will be derived. So I think a better question is, how much would this be worth to somebody like you? Not you personally, but somebody like you, how much do you think they should pay? That's what I would ask. And you know, when you frame it that way, they're like, oh, well now that you ask, you know, uh, you know blah, blah, blah. And by the way, also what I found is that people aren't, some, some people's brains aren't wired to answer open-ended questions. Uh, they, are, they can't process that, like, I don't know, right, is it would be the answer for a lot of these people. But if you frame it as like, well, do you think you would pay like $500,000 for it? And just kind of, you know, anchor to some number, it doesn't even matter what the number is. Oh, no, no, that, that seems too high. Well, like maybe 100 or 200,000? Uh, yeah, maybe something like that if it did this, this, and this. 
you know, or maybe if it had a little few more things. So like maybe 50,000 today or 80,000, something like that. Yeah, you know, in the ballpark, you know. So does that make sense? You know, like people can't just open-ended give you numbers, uh, but they can kind of give you some directional guidance. And, th you know, by the way, like if you had asked it this way, you know, maybe they say, you, maybe they say, yeah, I could probably do around 80,000. You know, that same entrepreneur, if they just kind of said, oh, you know, fumbled with the pricing, uh, you know, we're, uh, we got pilot deals and we got this and, you know, $10,000, right? And now they just lost $70,000. Uh, so, okay, we talked about that. And, you know, part of it is, you know, I, by the way, I'm, you know, I'm obviously I'm trying to give you lots of tactics that you can go, like, you know, hit the streets with and go immediately deploy. And, you know, hopefully these are helpful. But the bigger thing that we're kind of going for here is, like, identifying, you know, are, are you, is your company and are you an early adopter, right? Is this the kind, like, you know, we're obviously, and there's no point hiding what you are, right? We're a small team. We're less than 10 people. We're really passionate about this domain. We've been studying it. We looked at the research. We looked at the academia. We've been talking to hundreds of customers. We're coming up with a, the a hypothesis of what we think is going to be transformational in, in this area. But, uh, and you've asked me about pricing, and you've given great feedback on the pain and the solution and the benefits, and you validated a lot of that. But at the end of the day, you know, is that, does that all kind of come together in a way where you guys would even want to try something like this, you know, and really, you know, lean in? I'm a big fan of leaning in, by the way. We use that all around the office. Le everybody's leaning in. We're leaning in on this feature. We're leaning in on this campaign. We're leaning in on this customer. So I don't know. Try it, you know, with the, your customers. You know, would this be something that you want to lean in on? Right? And they might say, well, what does leaning in look like? I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but, you know, what would leaning in look like to somebody like you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, question. How often do you think you get uh, an answer that's not totally honest? Not, not because they're trying to lie, but because, you know, for whatever reason, they, they don't know how to value you and they just want to give you an answer. So, yeah, so I guess, th yeah, the, everybody hear the question? What if you get like a BS answer? Um, so it, I guess you have to determine what, it, what you're really thinking about why, what kind of answer you're getting and what's the reasons behind that. So there might be just like somebody that's like a, just a hard ass negotiator and they're always just gonna low, low ball you and give you like a silly number. And I think you probably have to be pretty in the early in the process to, to basically say like, uh, you know, we're looking for these kinds of partners that are really collaborative, that are really looking for us to be successful and for, you know, for you to be successful and we want you to be successful with the software and we want this to be a real partnership. And you're gonna get a sense of whether that person can really kind of qualify for that kind of filter or not. And like somebody that's just trying to lowball you on price is probably, or like their ego is so big, or, or they're just kind of squeeze. They, they look at you as a vendor, not a partner. They're probably not going to be an early. They don't fall even under the criteria of early adopter, I think, uh, generally. But it also could be to your point that like maybe they don't really know the answer, and so they don't want to look uh, like they're uninformed, and they might just give you an answer that's uh, low, too low, uh, based on what you really think can, you know the real problem is. And that could be possible. Like, there's a lot of people in denial. They're just in denial of the problem. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, there I'd probably slow down the sales process and kind of say, hey, you know what, Bob? You know, you said that you think it's only, you know, the, the problem's only about $10,000 worth of potential. You know, uh, we're seeing that this is like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of potential. Do you mind if we spent like an hour or two kind of working with your team to quantify like really measure this, go and like, you know, you said the leads weren't closing, but you weren't sure how many there were, and then you weren't sure like how much was actually being missed, and you said, you know, maybe there's international leads too, but there's one even in your calculation. Do you think, what if we just spent an hour or two kind of doing a full kind of comprehensive analysis, and then we came back and presented that to you? I, I think that might be well, well uh, received, right? Like what do you got to lose? It's free. I'm going to spend the time. Um, yep. Hi, my name is Linda Hello. and uh, something that's interesting is that when I, I like looking at people's shoes because I can tell exactly how the leather is created yes. and so I <laughs> 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 so I worked in a synthetic leather company and two things I thought were really fun were 
was really understanding the, l the product and negotiating prices. So I'm really curious to see how you, what is negotiating a price look like to you when, or yeah, what are the steps of negotiation between you and the client for your company? So I, I mean, I could do a whole talk on that topic, <laughs> negotiation. Um, why don't we get through the presentation and then maybe if there's like more questions then we can just kind of have open forum. I'm happy to talk about that too. <coughs> Takes a lot of practice, I think, is the key. <laughs> like with most things in life. All right, so actually I think this might be the last slide or we're close to it. So. Um, you know, so, okay, what are your goals with all this stuff? We talked about pricing, we talked about the first meeting. Uh, you know, there's obviously, I mean, if you're selling like a six figure sophisticated enterprise software, you know, platform, you know, it's not gonna just be the first meeting, there's gonna be a whole host of meetings, security, legal, procurement, you're probably, you know, doing the price negotiation, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think what you'll find is that if you really do connect with an early adopter, you're like, they're a change agent. That's what you're really looking for. You know, you're kind of, you're presenting this concept to them and they're gonna get excited. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna like, you know, come around to your side of the table or they're gonna, you know, kind of say, hey, we could be doing this or that or wow, I hadn't even thought about that before. Like those to me, like those are like the breakthrough conversations that you're searching for. If somebody says, wow, I had never thought of that before, that's like a huge win, right? And so that's what your kind of process of discovery is when you're kind of going through this process. And, um, and so, you know, what your two goals in all of this are, Obviously, it would be nice to sign some customers, right? Because that makes it easier to get employees, investors, and more customers. Um, and, you know, and then, but the other thing is like learning and listening. Um, so what works, what doesn't work? One thing that I'm hypercritical about is listening to the language that's working or trying new language, and then, but being really kind of disciplined to kind of test it, uh, you know, I think, if you hear, and I, I go back to the entrepreneur, like the most typical entrepreneur is they get a meeting, they, they don't ask any questions, they jump into their product, they do the demo, and then they're kind of like, so, you know, what do you think? And, and, I, and I think it's all about like really learning what kind of language, you know, you should be using. Uh, the, because um, that's gonna go into your website, it's gonna go into your, 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 your messaging, it's gonna go into how you tell the story, how you hire people, I mean, it's really pervasive. Um, and then the other thing is like, not only the message, but also like, who's the target market for this? By the way, it turns out at Badgeville, you know, I showed you those emails that I sent in like 2010. Those, and those, you know, those are just the same emails I sent. Th those were all when I thought like, oh, the target market for this is like some kind of like blogging websites. You saw all the examples, they're all like blogging kind of things. And maybe they're gonna use it to like drive like engagement on their, their blog website. Well, it turns out that blogs actually don't have any money. So there's like, there's no real market. They like high interest, low ability to implement the product and, and zero resources and money. So like that's a horrible target market. So, you know, we adjusted and we kind of found the real market and you know, that's, uh, you know, that's what allowed the company to start to scale. Um, and you know, the other thing that I see from entrepreneurs is, you know, they're like, oh, you know what, I, I, they, they're like the founder, maybe their engineering background, and they're say like, oh, I can't wait till I hire like a salesperson, then they can have to deal with all this stuff. And you know, uh, actually there's a reference to it in the last presentation, Mark Leslie wrote the sales learning curve, and the sales learning curve, you know, dictates that you can't hire more salespeople, or you shouldn't hire more salespeople, until you can actually drive a, a, a degree of sales productivity uh, with by yourself and your your kind of founding team, uh, because how, like first of all, how could you expect to somebody that's not as like passionate about the product doesn't is not an expert in the domain and the field to execute at a higher level than you? And uh, you know it's more likely that if if you can't do it, you haven't yet found kind of product market fit. And why are you ready to? Why are you already going to start hiring salespeople? And by the way, like then a whole different question of like well. You know, what if I could get a salesperson that would only work on commission, not a base salary? You know, if, you're only, if you can only get those kind of people, there's already some other kind of problem going on, right? You know, because the, the best salespeople don't work in that model. So I guess, the, the, you know, there's a whole, we could talk, spend a lot of time talking about this topic. And there is a really great document by Mark Leslie called The Sales Learning Curve. It's a PDF, it's free on the internet. Go ahead and get it. But it just says, you have to basically do this yourself. And an interesting just kind of maybe observation I have is, it's interesting like how many engineering uh, founders 
they're, they're studying everything. They're on Hacker News. They're reading every blog post on, like, you know, on architecture and all these things. But then they've never read a single sales book. Like, that's kind of baffling to me. Uh, like, the one thing that really matters, you know, technology, you can always, you know, build your team. You're going to rework your platform. You're going to re-architect anyway. But the only thing that matters is customers in B2B. And so if you don't have customers, then, you know, the company's not going to survive. So uh, maybe applying the same kind of interest and expertise and practice uh, on the sales side would be useful, too. So that's the end of the talk. I can, and then we can just do questions if you'd like. Okay, sure. Here. Hi, thanks for sharing. Um, so I have a question about the pricing. Um, I, I, you didn't use the competitor price uh, when you negotiate, and I, I want to know why is that, and uh, what's the pro and cons using competitor pricing? So what your competitor pay? Okay, uh, so for competitive for pricing? Yeah. Okay, so, all right, so I have some opinions on this topic. Um, so first off, in a new category where, that you're, where you're disrupting the, the market and you're bringing something new to the market, okay, there are no competitors. There are alternatives, Alternative, yes. but there's no, like nobody competes because, right. you know, that's like, it just, it's not even like in the sphere of like thinking, I guess. And, you know, but I think a reasonable approach would be to say something like anchor your price to a price that people can understand Right. So, okay, so at my, n at my new company, BetterWorks, uh, we sell uh, software that does like operational excellence right. uh, for companies. And we find that a lot of our customers have Workday. And we don't compete with Workday, but they've, they're familiar with buying Workday. And Workday charges $25 per seat per month. Right. And so when they say, you know, because now we have more than 10 customers, we have figured out the pricing. When they say, how much is your pricing? I don't say we haven't figured that out. I say, well, Workday charges $25 per user per month for their service. We charge $15 per user per month. Okay. And everybody always usually says, hmm, okay, yeah, they, you know, interesting. I, is that same number which you keep right now, it's aligned to what you have right now, it's $15? Yeah. It's close. Yeah, okay. but I had probably like 100 conversations to get to that number. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. So, so yeah, in, in new companies don't have competitors, they have alternatives. And maybe it's useful to anchor to a an easily understandable kind of benchmark when you talk about your price. Yeah, uh, two two questions uh, regarding that. Th the first question: um, If you don't have a competitor, but um, y can you use the pricing of uh, the alternatives and start increasing it through time? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Sounds logical? I think so. Okay. I mean, so the, his question was, can you increase price over time? Yeah. So the answer is yes. So here's how I think about software. Okay, so software is, uh, software gets better over time because you add more engineers and time incre increases the quality of the product. And software is only always ever 10% done. So like a year ago, our software was only 10% done. And today, our software is still only 10% done. And in a year from now, it'll still be 10% done. Yeah. So software only improves. And uh, you know, but here's one maybe meta point on this is, when we talk about the first 10 customers, okay, we don't want to give the software away for free. Because like, what quality signal is that? Like, I gave it away for free. You know, like they were just bored and they bought it. Is that's what that tells me. They just had nothing to do. They just wanted a fun little project. Uh, so, but if they, you know, hey, I worked with them, we determined that this was the impact, they bought a license and they paid some reasonable amount of money. You yeah. know, there's nothing in the slides that says maximize the deal, squeeze every penny out of them, right? Mm -hmm. I would say charge a fair price that tells you that you're getting some kind of a reasonable commitment and then you know, over time, you know, probably by your 10th customer, you'll find that this one you had to do like an enterprise license for 30,000. This one, the department bought it, but they didn't want to pay that, so they paid 5,000. This one's paying whatever. 
and you've got like all these different data points, and then hopefully you should be able to kind of formulate your real kind of pricing strategy. Right. And what typically happens if you're really onto something here is you'll have your standard edition, which is fifteen dollars a license. Oh, if you want that and this, then it's probably going to go to our enterprise edition, which is twenty-five dollars a license. And you know, and then we've got the basic edition for the real kind of like, you know low end of the market, and that's $10 per user per license. Uh, one thing I would, ha I would r recommend against doing, unless you're like a very low cost, low end kind of product, I don't think you need to start to create these tiers until you've really built some kind of, like enough data points of real customers buying the software. Great, so uh, just another quick question no. about, uh, no? <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry, we're so crunch on time right okay. now. Okay, all right. Um, Never mind. So, 